third of these transformations is in what we call the social relationships of text and learning. So you've got a picture in your mind's eye of a traditional classroom. Well, look at this classroom here. It's just another traditional classroom where there aren't many social relations. Perhaps these kids are connecting with each other. Doesn't look like it. Looks like they're each doing their own work um, as if they were on a textbook or as if they were doing their own work all by themselves. So in fact, we can have all these technological uh, innovations going on, but no pedagogical innovation. Now, what we want to illustrate now is how these social relationships of text and learning may change in these digital learning environments. So what we've done here is we've got this creator space. You can see the little creator app um, uh, is lit up. And here we have a student who on the left-hand side of the screen has been working on a biography. I, I think from memory it's a grade uh, eight student working on biography. And what they're doing is on the right, they've got the common core standards, um, which are about information text, which have been rewritten by the teacher to focus on biographies as information text. And what the, the student has to be writing about is Rosa Parks. So all the students have chosen uh, different people to, uh, to write a biography of. And the theme is uh, ordinary people who have ended up leading extraordinary lives. Here um, uh, you, on the right you see uh, an assessment rubric including a very clear specification of rating levels. And the work has gone out to several different reviewers and they've each given it these uh, scores. They've pulled across a little slider and that's the score that's come up and that's the average of three uh, peers scores and here what you can see from one of the peers you can see some of the feedback that's been given so against each of these criteria um, there's been uh, both a quantitative uh, rating which is the slider and the score uh, but also uh, uh, qualitative feedback which is oriented constructively towards rewriting and also what we have is we have an annotations tool in here where you can highlight a bit of text um, and you can then write a comment about that annotation. And in fact, what can happen is that the, uh, the person who's the author can then, or the teacher for that matter, can, can write back a comment here and there can be kind of a discussion about a particular point, even when the setting is that it's anonymous peer review. Another very different example in a, in a site where Mary and I have been working. Um, this is a site here at the University of Illinois where we have veterinary medicine students doing uh, what we call critical clinical reasoning, clinical analyses. So this is an animal that came into the, uh, the veterinary hospital here at the U of I with a whole lot of symptoms and what the students are doing are analysing those symptoms. Again, it's a multimodal text, it includes images, it includes x-rays, it includes data sets. Um, so this is multimodal writing in the form of uh, a clinical analysis. Now here is um, a bit of feedback but also feedback on the feedback where the person who, uh, who um, uh, wrote the original work is writing a comment back. So this is kind of recursive. There can be discussions around this work. Another example in a project that Mary and I have been involved in, uh, we've been in a, a project with the Norwegian Red Cross. And look, I'm showing you these different examples as a way to illustrate um, the range in which, uh, the range of ways in which a generic learning ecology can be applied in very different settings. So this is a project with the Norwegian Red Cross who are um, running a training program in uh, English and Arabic and Spanish for para paramedics who work in danger zones. So paramedics involved with the Ebola crisis in West Africa, paramedics in this case involved in uh, the war in Syria. Um, and they, these paramedics work in very, very dangerous situations. And this is a project where they're sharing each other's experience against a rubric around, uh, you know, the dynamics of paramedic, um, uh, paramedic service. Now, this happens to be in Arabic. You'll see the text goes from right to left. It happens that my browser is an English browser, so all the, the rest of the text is in English. But um, you can see here this is um, this project. And in fact, look, to actually be able to do learning, this is the, the notion of ubiquitous learning, the power of online learning. Um, 
uh, have people in war zones where there's no proper inst institutional infrastructure for traditional training programs, uh, getting involved in training that's run from Norway um, is one of the affordances, one of the possibilities in these digital environments. This is another project we're involved with from the World Health Organization where we had um, a number of people from all around the world who were building uh, what, what are called routine immunization plans. So as a preventative um, strategy, immunizing populations to try and reduce uh, the levels of disease, particularly in developing countries. So these people are from all over the world. Now, the World Health Organization had this, I don't know, seven point, nine point plan. How many little circles are there in that, that little uh, avatar there? Um, and they had been going out with PowerPoints um, uh, and telling people how to do um, you know, global routine immunization. Well, there are two problems with that. Uh, one is people often already know what, you know, that's their job and they know what they're doing and they don't need to be told. Um, and the second thing is that local knowledge and local experience from one place to another is different. So what we did is we turned those, uh, those points into, an, into a rubric, which meant the scaffold was the new framework developed by the World Health Organization but we were valuing local knowledge as they applied that scaffold to their own context and then peer reviewed each other's immunization plans um, along the way. So these are just examples of the way in which these new social relations of text can produce um, knowledge relationships which are much more horizontal, much more peer to peer. And this is an example of one of the plans. This is the plan for Liberia and you see there that there's on the left there's the um, there's some of the information in the plan on the right, some of the feedback from one of the several uh, peer reviewers. Another example, this is from one of Mary and my classes where there's a student writing about wikis. And what we've done on the right is we've actually built a rubric based on our learning by design theory. So this is a particular rubric where we're interested in the nature of knowledge and learning, um, hence the learning by design schema. And we built a rubric on the right, which is quite a sophisticated, elaborate, complicated rubric uh, for assessing the, the work that the, uh, the student was doing on the right. It happened to be work about using wikis in education. And here are, here are some comments made by me you know, with annotations. And in this case, the comments were coded um, by those three little codes, three letter codes which come out of our learning by design framework. Now, let me just mention just almost by way of a tangent, a very ambitious project we have now with our computer science colleagues here at the University of Illinois, is that we're hoping that by coding um, uh, the annotations, that we can have the participants in a project training the machine to recognize certain features in the text, certain semantic features. And this is a whole area in the domain of artificial intelligence, which is called machine learning. So we're involved in a very kind of ambitious way in experimenting with these e-learning environments and pushing the boundaries such that the machine becomes a support for human beings. The machine learns from human beings. It's, it's a, it's a human-computer relationship. It's not computers doing things. It's computers working with humans and humans training computers um, to, to be helpful participants in this knowledge and assessment process. The social learning and collaborative intelligence process Here's a kind of a diagram of the model. So what we have is we have, you know, uh, doing a draft, looking at the rubric, uh, looking at other people's peer reviews uh, and doing a peer review. Uh, we have feedback um, that comes back. Uh, we have feedback on the feedback. We have a revision. So we have a whole lot of processes where this is iterative, where it happens systematically, but there are a lot of points of cycling back and over things, refining things, getting social feedback along the way. So the idea is that this is um, systematizing these processes of collaborative intelligence. And in fact, what we have is we have a kind of a theory underlying this, where on the two sides of the screen, uh, what are the social processes? Well, on the left-hand side of the, the screen, we have uh, cognition. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have metacognition. So we've got learning activities, which might be about you know, being a paramedic in a war zone or analysing a dog or um, doing a, a biography of Rosa Parks. Um, Self-regulation of learning where, you know, you see the project objectives, um, you've got a timeline, you can see exactly where you're going. You've got disciplinary practice on the left, which is thinking about a specific subject or topic, but 
disciplinary thinking on the on 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 the on the on the right, which is thinking about um, what it takes to make it write a good biography, what it takes to write a good global a good immunization plan. We've got empirical work on the left, which is the dog and Rosa Parks and Liberia um, on the left, and we've got theoretical work on the, on the right, which is thinking about um, uh, you know um, the nature of immunization, the nature of biography. We've got individual intelligence on the left. I'm doing my work. Collaborative intelligence on the right, where I'm getting feedback and giving feedback. Uh, but also we have learning on the left, um, which is um, something substantive. But on the right we have assessment. So in other words, the rubric and the feedback um, all ends up as assessment data. And finally, what happens is this work gets published to each participant's profile. And here's an example of one of our um, participants in our class where um, he's produced this incredible range of peer-reviewed works. The little kid in the class doing the biography had a lovely portfolio of works that she had done in, uh, in English language arts. Uh, the, the people who are the paramedics end up with a, these peer-reviewed uh, reports of uh, the work that they did. The, the immunization plans end up being part of a knowledge bank for the World Health Organization. So the idea is that all along the way, these are social artifacts. Now you think about the traditional artifact of the assessment. I do my project, one person looks at it, the teacher, and they hand it back with a mark, and then what do I do with it? Well, I put it in a drawer. Whereas at every step in the process, this has been a very social, very collaborative knowledge production process. So uh, what Bill has um, uh, exemplified with all the very uh, different uh, examples of participants working within in CG Scholar uh, is the way in which those two spaces that we designed, uh, the community space and the creator space, uh, are interrelated. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that uh, the work that you've seen and the work that Bill describes of course, draws on diversity, as we've spoken about already, on agency of learner, on uh, multiple uh, experts being able to come together to uh, in engage around knowledge and produce knowledge. But all of this doesn't happen in a haphazard way. What Bill also uh, mentioned as he described uh, the different uh, examples was that this uh, space is very... Uh, uh, astutely and carefully designed by the rubrics that the teacher or the instructor or the students or any group put together. Uh, the rubric determines and influences what happens in the community space. The rubric de determines and influences what happens in the creator space. And ultimately, the rubric is the means by which uh, the students give each other feedback, uh, judge their own work, and are able to perform to the highest standards possible. So it's a very constructed space which allows for a lot of creativity or flexibility, but it's a guided uh, instructional uh, ecology. And I just wanted to emphasise that point as well.